Everyone, welcome back to Vassals of King's Graves, Agatha Christie reread. And after our wonderful group discussion of Peril at End House, we're now back for our 14th episode to discuss Lord Edgware Dies, also known as 13 at Dinner. This book was originally published in 1933, and I'm going to ask you to bear that in mind when we discuss some of the more regressive aspects to this book and just think about what was going on in the world and particularly in Europe at that time. I think this book is a very important one. I don't think it's one of her best mysteries, but if you're looking at Agatha Christie as someone to explain changing social mores throughout the 20th century, this is a very important one, not only because of what it shows you of what was being thought at the time and deemed as socially acceptable to say, but also because of how the book has been censored or not as the decades have passed. So we'll get into that in due course. This is a book where we have... Poirot, (laughs) the Belgian detective, um, reunited with Colonel Hastings and also Inspector Jap. So this is very much the core triumvirate investigating the crime. The crime is revealed in the title, Lord Edgware Dies. Um, And as usual, I'm going to talk a little bit more about plot and character without revealing any spoilers before the end credits music and then afterwards I'll get into the plot resolution and the issues I may or may not have with that. So let's get into the story. The The book opens with a theatre performance um, and then goes into a dinner at the Savoy and a couple of commissions for Poirot. So the theatre performance is being given by Carlotta Adams, who in real life is a quiet girl with a low, pleasant voice and, quote, a kind of personified soft agreement. So very passive in real life, very reserved. But on stage, she is an amazing mimic. She can switch her whole physical presence and her voice to different ages, sexes, um, to take on people from low stations of life and the aristocracy, all sorts of foreign characters. And she's an absolute sensation. She's playing sold out shows. She was apparently based on an American actress called Ruth Draper, who Agatha Christie had been to see shortly before writing this book. And you can really feel that vividly in the way that Christie describes the brilliance of this performance and the respect for Draper slash Adams artistry. And it's really wonderful to read. Part of her act is to do impersonations. And one of the people that she impersonates is a American actress called Jane Wilkinson, who is in the audience. And Jane Wilkinson is tremendously beautiful, we're told, very charismatic. She has a husky low voice and she's almost irresistible to men. And she has married into the British aristocracy a man called Lord Edgware, who is going to die. Um, Very early on, Poirot gives a character sketch of her. He says, oh, sorry, very early on, Hastings gives a character sketch of Lady Edgware. She's almost always referred to actually as Jane Wilkinson, which is also interesting. Um, Through the eyes of Poirot, and he says, quote, I doubt if she could play a small part adequately, or even what is called a character part. The play must be written about her and for her. Such people go through life in great danger, he goes on to explain, because they are quite monodirectional. You know, they want what they want when they want it, and that can lead them into dangerous situations. So we we get a lot of reveal about Lady Edgware. And being told that offstage Lord Edgware is not a nice man, one can see that she might have a good (laughs) motivation for his murder. In fact, she tells us so in the first few pages of the book. After the theatre performance, they go for dinner at the Savoy. There's a little party in her rooms. And she says uh, very clearly to Poirot, who she drags off for a commission, that please go and speak to my husband. I want a divorce. I want to marry someone else. And in fact, she wants to marry up. She wants to marry the Duke of Merton, a young man who we are led to believe is incredibly religious, very monkish, one of the richest men in England. And she asks for Poirot's help to get a divorce. So she has a motive for the murder, evidently. 
Other people that we see are another actor called Brian Martin, who again is very, very good looking. This is a book full of incredibly good looking people. He's a screen actor. He is, quote, a tall, extremely good looking man of the Greek god type, according to Hastings. Um, he's quite bitchy about Jane, though, even though they're friends. And he t- tells Poirot again and again that he thinks she would commit murder to get what she wants, which is quite weird behaviour from someone who's supposedly your friend. So that all happens in this opening night of the novel, the theatre performance, the dinner, and then these two commissions, Jane's commission and Brian trying to also engage Poirot to discover a man with a golden tooth who's after him. Um, but really, it seems that he wants to basically um, defame defame his friend Jane Wilkinson, a.k.a. Lady Edgware. We then move forward to Akil Poirot going to Regent's Park to meet Lord Edgware, who reveals actually that he's perfectly willing to divorce his wife. In fact, he's changed his mind. He changed it six months ago and he actually wrote to her to tell her something which Lady Edgware is incredibly excited to discover, um, but claims she never got the letter. So who is lying and who is not? Um, Lord Edgware, we're told he looks bad tempered and bitter. His eyes had a queer, secretive look about them. In his household, we also have his daughter, Geraldine Marsh, who seems very shy and shrinking. She's the daughter of his first marriage. His first wife also ran away from him. So he's obviously a really nasty guy. Um, And we also have Alton, the butler, the new butler, who, again, is incredibly good looking. Tall and fair, he might have posed to a sculptor for Hermes or Apollo. And again, Hastings required... uh, describes him as saying the Greek god of a butler. So we have some very, very good looking people in this book. So Lord Edgware is willing to give his wife a divorce. Nonetheless, the next day, uh, Inspector Jap turns up at Hercule Poirot's house to say, you know, that chap you saw yesterday, he's turned up dead in his library, stabbed in the back of the neck. Um, We obviously suspect Lady Edgware, what did he say to you? And they go around to see her. She's shocked, horrified, but also very, very happy and almost preternaturally calm in these circumstances and describes her movements as follows. She said, well, last night, last afternoon, I said to everyone, I wasn't going to go out to dinner, but I changed my mind. Um, My maid, Ellis, said I should go. It's rude to break engagements. I went to see my friend, Mrs. Van Dusen, at the Piccadilly Palace Hotel before she left back to go back to America. I then went to the dinner party in Chiswick of Sir Montague Corner, was hosting this dinner party. I was there all night. I have a perfect alibi. The only slightly odd thing is someone made a prank call and asked to speak to me at the dinner. So she has the perfect alibi. Um, The other characters who we're going to meet are Donald Ross, who is another actor who he hopes... Uh, So Montague Corner will help with his career. He's an acting manager and knows movie producers. We have Miss Carroll, who is Lord Edgware's secretary. She says that it doesn't matter that Lady Edgware is at a dinner party. I saw her enter the house on the night of the murder. Um, We also have Ronnie Marsh, the dissipated Ronnie Marsh, who is the heir to the, the title. He becomes Lord Edgware. He is desperate for money. He is in dire straits. He lived with Lord Edgware until three years ago when they had some massive argument and he was kicked out. And he does come across a little bit as a holdover from the Bright Young Things 20 books, um, the Jeeves and Worcesterish type feckless youth, but actually is he as stupid as he makes out he is. So those are all of the characters that are in play. Well, not all of them, but most of the main characters that are in play at the time of the murder that is hinted at in the title of the book. And I will leave it there. I'll get back to it after the end credits in terms of how I feel it resolves. Now, I do think it is a very intricately plotted book and I think it's well plotted, (laughs) but I do think it's very easy to detect um, and so easy to detect early on for me that I felt that getting through the intricate plotting was just um, just annoying because I wanted to get to the end of the book and just see if I was right. So let's see once you've read it, if you agree with me. I would say, however, that I think perhaps... The most interesting thing about this book, sadly, is what it tells us about the attitudes at the time towards race and towards homosexuality, the latter being something new to talk about. Um, So let's maybe do that second. 
But first of all, let's talk about race because I can do that in a very spoiler free way. Sadly, it's 1933. This is after Agatha Christie has met someone who's been to Germany. Well, no, she's been to Germany and met someone and has seen the impact of anti Semitism when enacted in law. Nonetheless, it is still really showing up in her books. And I think actually more pervasively than any other of her books that I have read, including Parallel and House, which was already really anti Semitic. So early on in the novel, Carlotta is seen as being successful because she is Jewish. She is seen as loving money to an extent that will take her from prudence to danger. She is seen as being clearly Semitic in her features. So all that that sort of classic anti-Semitism, they are concerned with money, they're greedy, they're great at making it. That rapacious capitalism is absolutely there in the character of Carlotta Adams. This is an exchange between Hastings and Poirot very early on in the novel. This is what Poirot says to Hastings. You observed without doubt that she's a Jewess. Hastings in response. I had not, but now that he mentioned it, I saw the faintest traces of Semitic ancestry. Poirot nodded, quote, it makes for success that, though there is still one avenue of danger, since it is of danger that we are talking. Hastings, you mean? Poirot, love of money. Love of money might lead such a one from a prudent and cautious path. So I'll get back to this in the after show, but it's it's obviously really obvious blatant anti-Semitism. It happens again and again. Later on, the dissipated heir to the Edgware title, Ronnie Marsh, uh, reveals that his alibi on the night of the murder is that he was squiring Rachel Dortheimer at the opera for money. Quote, I'm whispering sweet nothings into the diamond encrusted ears of the fair brackets. I beg pardon, dark, close brackets, Rachel, in a box at Covent Garden. Her nose is quivering with emotion, end quote. I mean, that is just the most disgusting physical anti-Semitism I've read for quite some time. We also have the description of Sir Montague Corner, who was very successful in the movie industry. Quote, he had a distinctly Jewish cast of countenance, very small, intelligent black eyes and a carefully arranged toupee. He is seen as being very pretentious, being very affected. And the big film producer he has at his house also has a Jewish sounding name. So, oh, there is clearly this perception from Agatha Christie that people who are successful, who are capitalist, who are without bounds, are often Jewish and that they control big industry. So in other books, it's been banking, antiques. Here it is, the cinema industry. And it's just so disappointing to read it. Interesting, however, that it is kept in in modern publications. The reason I say it is interesting is because um, there are other types of racism that are not included in modern printings of Agatha Christie. So the same character, Ronnie Marsh, who was being very anti-Semitic, also has some very horrible things to say about Chinese people who he calls chinks and says he cannot distinguish between them. And there's also a passage where he uses the N-word that is not together with a passage on Chinese people in my paperback version of Lord Edgware Dies that I bought for this reread. I think it's important to acknowledge what was happening in culture in the 1930s that allowed incredible, you know, suffering and murder to take place. Um, Quote, he shook his head sadly, then cheered up suddenly and drank off some more champagne. Anyway, he said, I'm not a damned N-word. This reflection seemed to cause him such elation that he presently made several remarks of a hopeful character, end quote. Obviously, I find it incredibly sad here that Agatha Christie is showing anti-Semitic and racist remarks. Um, in fairness, that you know, some of them are in the mouth of Ronnie Marsh, so maybe Agatha Christie doesn't reflect those. But I think it's very hard on the anti-Semitism when it's so pervasive and it's in the it's in the mouth of Hastings and Poirot, her protagonist. You cannot say that she's trying to critique it. You cannot say this is a meta showing of you know taking prejudice and turning it on its head. I mean, this is just straightforward prejudice. What I find really fascinating, and if I ever, you know, win the lottery, which I do not play and have all the time in the world and all the money in the world, I will investigate this. I think what is really fascinating, and someone must have written a book on this or done a PhD on this, is how attitudes to the extant racism change through the years and through the different printings in different countries of her books. Because the bit, as I said, on Ronnie Marsh using the N-word has been completely erased from my edition. And yet the publisher who saw fit to take out that type of racism has not seen a problem with keeping in all the anti-Semitism. 
Um, so I would love to understand how these books, not only when they were written, but as they have been published and republished and republished, have been censored to meet the so-called standards of our time. And I would encourage you all to read a book by David Bedeal, who's an amazing British um, stand-up comedian and political satirist. But he's written an amazing polemical essay called Jews Don't Count, which is exactly about this issue whereby anti-Semitism is seen as a kind of lesser racism. And while other racisms are excised or discussed critically, somehow anti-Semitism slips slips under the radar and is seen as kind of OK or permissible or different and allowable. And I really think you could do an amazing essay on how Agatha Christie te- texts have been treated through the decades um, through the lens of Jews don't count. Anyway, I'm really sorry if you tuned in for a fun story about murder mystery, but it's so pervasive in the book, you just cannot, cannot ignore it. There is, sadly, another type of regressive behaviour in these books, which is kind of a little bit new. But again, it's all pervasive in this book, and that is homophobia. And it is a bit tricky here because we are going to have to interrogate the use of the word queer, which I know some people find as offensive as the N word or as, you know, the C word for Chinese people, the K word for um, African people in South African novels that Agatha Christie has written. Um, But let's talk about the word queer, because at the time it was obviously in common use as it is now as meaning odd or spoiled. So you would say someone's queered the pitch, someone's messed up the pitch. Um, it, it, was a, it was a word, and still is, I think, in England, used to describe strange behaviour, odd behaviour. But evidently, it had also come to be used to describe homosexuals, and obviously pejoratively, that they are not normal, they are not default, that they are somehow less than or other or corrupted from what should be. And I think the first written, someone will correct me, I'm sure, the first written um, use of this was in one of the transcripts of one of the Oscar Wilde of the Oscar Wilde trial in the 1880s. So certainly by the 1920s and 1930s, the word queer was very slippery and had multiple meanings. Now, here's where it gets gets really interesting. Um, I'm going to discuss what is going on with this. Oh, can I do it without doing spoilers? So when it comes to the character of Lord Edgware, he is described as such. Um, in the first chapter where we meet Lord Edgware, the, used, the word queer is used about him about 20 times in the chapter. First of all, his wife says of him, quote, he should never have married anyone. I know what I'm talking about. I just can't describe him, but he's queer, end quote. Uh, when we meet him in person through the eyes of Hastings, quote, his eyes had a queer, secretive look about them. This is what Hastings has to say about the butler, who is incredibly good looking and turned up six months ago, not uncoincidentally when Lord Edgware suddenly decides to give his second wife a divorce. Quote, vaguely effeminate and I disliked the softness in his voice. We then go on to conflate the fact that Lord Edgware is probably gay, is probably having a relationship with his butler, with sexual fetishes and perversions. So it's almost like just the sheer act of being homosexual now has to be conflated with with being sadistic and perverted. So on the bookshelves behind Lord Edgware are books on Casanova and the Comte de Sade. Poirot says, quote, I imagine he practices many curious vices, end quote. Is this just being homosexual? Is this sadism? He's meant to have treated his daughter, Geraldine Marsh, very cruelly. We then discover, as Inspector Jap, sorry, Chief Inspector Jap starts investigating the murder, that the butler, quote, seems he's mis- mixed up with a couple of rather disreputable nightclubs. Not the usual thing. Something a great deal more recherche and nasty, end quote. Clearly, I think Agatha Christie is trying to imply that Lord Edgware is gay, that he has fallen in love with the butler, or is having a relationship with the butler, and now wants the second wife out of the way. However, the reason I think this is homophobic is because I do believe it carries over into confusing and conflating homosexuality with sadism, cruelty and perversion. And that would have been, I expect, very much of its time. It's interesting that this has not been taken out of the book either, although the N word has been. So that's apparently OK to show still. Um, again, fascinating, but really horrific. Okay, I'm realising this short episode is turning into rather a long one, but here we go. This is also a book where we have not one, not two, but three counts and three adaptations because it's Hercule Poirot, so we always get adaptations with him. 
The first was actually released only a year after the book came out in 1934. It's a British black and white film directed by Henry Edwards and stars Austin Trevor as Hercule Poirot and uh, the much married Jane Carr as um, as Lady Edgware. It is one of three films that was made by Twickenham Studios in the 1930s. They were what were called, called quota quickies. This is when the British government made you make and show British made films. And they were really worried about Hollywood taking over the British film industry. So they were trying to encourage local production. Um, you can actually just watch it on YouTube if you just punch in Lord Edgware Dies 1934. It will come up in full. It's an hour and 15 minutes long. Um, I think it's actually pretty good. What's kind of shocking is that Austin Trevor is not fat and does not have a moustache as Hercule Poirot. Um, pretty much everyone else has a moustache, though, so maybe he's trying to stand out. He's actually quite suave and handsome, I thought. It rocks along very quickly. It shows how quickly you can get through these plots. It's incredibly faithful to the book. So if you want the cheat sheet and it's got some amazing fashion in it of that period, um, you also see uh, in the opening credits, because in those days, film credits were all at the start, The Coiffeur by Charles. I love that period where, you know, people were just known by one name and, you know, they did the gowns and they did the hair. So it's really fun. It is the first on-screen portrayal of Hercule Poirot. So worth checking out on that basis alone. Austin Trevor did go on to do Alibi and Black Coffee. So the two plays Agatha Christie wrote on screen, but... Um, we've lost those sadly a lot of a lot of early films have been lost we're very lucky to still have Lord Edgeware Die so do check that one out secondly there's also a, a 1985 made for TV film called 13 at Dinner it stars uh, Peter Ustinov as Poirot so he'll go on to be in many big budget films but this was actually a TV version um, it is very famous because it stars David Suchet as Inspector Jap not as Poirot that he would go on to play in all of those British ITV TV serials um, and it also stars amazingly Faye Dunaway as Lady Edgware and it was first on TV in 1985 on CBS um, and it was contemporary which sounds a bit weird However, sadly, I've not watched it. I tried, I hunted high and low and I just couldn't find it to watch, which is really sad. So if anyone in America, maybe it's on like CBS streaming services. If you've seen it, please let me know. I'd love to watch it. And then last but not least, we have the TV adaptation starring David Suchet in his rightful role as Ezekiel Poirot. Um, it was filmed and produced and aired in 2000 as part of the series of Poirot. Um, it is very, very faithful to the novel. The only real change is that you have Miss Lemon, um, so she becomes part of the investigation. But basically, it's pretty it's pretty faithful to the book. Um, I actually think it holds up pretty well. I do. The only difference is, I suppose, that in neither the film, actually, nor in this, do I feel that Jane Wilkerson, Lady Edgeware, is as strong and charismatic and domineering as she is in the book. Which is a shame because actually she's a really cool, iconic female character of Agatha Christie. And again and again and again, right? Uh, Agatha Christie is very progressive when she writes women. Sadly, not so much when dealing with other races and indeed homosexuality, as we find out in this novel. So I'm not sure if I want to encourage you or not to read this book. I do think it's really interesting. I do think it's a good puzzle mystery. It really evokes London of its time. I mean, all the hotels, the addresses, you, the, the journey times all add up. You can, if you if you know London, you can really imagine yourself traveling these journeys. Um, and you do get, unfortunately, a sense of what was seen as socially acceptable at the time in terms of how to describe Jewish people um, and gay people, which is not pleasant. But anyways... <laughs> Stay tuned. We have got an absolute doozy for you in the next episode. It's Murder on the Orient Express. So that is one of her all-time most favourite books. I hope you come back for that and don't get put up, put off by all the politics chat in this. It's just something you cannot, cannot overlook as a contemporary reader. Anyway, stay tuned for more after the end credits. <laughs> Okie dokie. So we are back and we are now going to be spoiler filled. I think this one is very, very easy to solve. And it's especially easy to solve if you've been doing an Agatha Christie reread, because you know that anyone who's an actor or who has acting talent is not to be trusted and is probably impersonating someone at some point or other. 
you know that every time that Agatha Christie prints a letter or prints a map of a room, that if it's a letter for sure, it's not to be trusted. Someone might have altered a date or a name or ripped a little bit here or ripped a little bit there. So those are two big clues. I feel that the, the, the solution is evident from the opening sort of 10 pages of the book, because in the opening 10 pages of the book, Poirot says that Lady Edgware, Jane Wilkinson, is utterly egocentric, driven, narcissistic, and will do anything to get what she wants. And this puts her in danger. So you have her ability to be a murderess. You also have Carlotta Adams, again, very talented act- actress, and we're told that because, brackets, she's Jewish, she loves money, and that love of money is going to lead her to do imprudent things and take risks and be in danger. So we know the two women are going to be involved in the murder. And then, even more so, we are told very early on in the novel, I think it's in the first 10 pages, that um, the Duke of Merton is an Anglo-Catholic, so he will not accept a divorce. He will not accept it. So we have, with Jane Wilkinson, both the character that would do what she wants to get what she wants and the fact that she has to resort to murder. It's not enough to be divorced. And once we know that Carlotta Adams can impersonate her perfectly and therefore provide an alibi, it's very easy to see how the murder is done. And then you kind of just mechanically have to go through the rest of the novel and get rid of the side plots, um, which is frustrating because they're well plotted. But you kind of feel, okay, now I need to wade through this to get to the end. I suppose the, the only thing I didn't really suspect was that the murder weapon would be a corn knife because in modern life when we have better fitting shoes I don't even know whether young readers would know what corns are and what a corn knife is is uh so again this is such a problematic book but it is enjoyable to read it is well plotted and the characters are vivid particularly those of Jane Wilkerson and Carlotta but my god it is problematic as a read and even more provocative in what it tells us about contemporary publishing and what they deem it is acceptable to publish and not publish in the year of our lord 2022 anyway on that rather grim and portentous note um, let's close out this episode and come back next time for the deliciously wonderful subversive brilliant murder on the orient express <laughs>